question, so I invite anyone who wants to grab a chair to take a seat. Um, welcome to this first ever TSB teacher training event. I am Paul, the program coordinator and library of resources, and I'll be your host today. Um, in welcoming you, I would like to acknowledge that this building is situated in one of the traditional territories, the territories of the Wenda, a mission of activation, the Bodhishami Confederacy, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and the Métis Nation. The treaty that was signed for this particular parcel of land is collectively referred to as the Toronto Purchase and applies to the lands of the Brown Line, to Woodbine Avenue, and North Forest with New Market. I also recognize the enduring presence of Indigenous peoples on this land. Today we are also live streaming this event. So I'm in addition to our audience here, I'd like to welcome anyone who's watching online. Please feel free to share your thoughts throughout the event on Twitter using the hashtag TDSB Greens. I know Chris will be doing that. So we're here to choose uh, the one book that our TDSB teachers should be reading right now. We've got five amazing educators who will be presenting what they think that book should be. <laughs> Um, and then it's going to be up to you, uh, based on the panelists' presentations, to vote either in person today or online for the book that you think all TDSB educators should be reading. And the book with the most votes will be our winner. I'd like to introduce our panelists, uh, starting with Raheem Isabe. Uh, Raheem has taught at TDSB and around the world. He currently teaches senior business and co-op education courses at John Kalani uh, Collegiate Institute where he enjoys providing students with real-life experiences through social entrepreneurship and strong community partnerships. Raheem has traveled, talked, volunteered, and studied in over 25 countries. Welcome, Raheem. Next <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.
first time ever, and I hope it will be my last. <laughs> I'd like to share a, a book called The Affordable Mind, uh, which was uh, created by uh, Roger Martin. Roger Martin is the former dean at the Rockland School of Management um, at the University of Toronto, and he came up with a theory called integrative thinking. Uh, he spent a number of years interviewing some uh, highly influential individuals in a non-for-profit and for-profit world. Uh, and he basically asked them one question. When faced with uh, two opposing tensions, two ways of, of solving a problem, how did these successful individuals come up with a third and alternative way of solving the solution that was far better than the first two options and was far more creative? Uh, and he coined this uh, integrative thinking. And he beautifully uh, articulates it here. The ability to face constructively the tension of opposing models. And instead of choosing one at the expense of the other, uh, to generate a creative resolution of the tension in the form of a brand new model that contains elements of both. Uh, and I'm hoping as I share that quote, you're starting to see where and when we can apply this integrative thinking. Uh, some highlights of the book truly stem from some concepts that revolve around mental modeling, uh, <coughs> systems thinking, and, and more importantly, causation, uh, which is key words that have been all across the corporate world uh, for the last decade, and there's tons of books on these, but he articulates, articulates it and beautifies it by using stories from our big organizations that we know, such as the Four Seasons, Dell, uh, uh, Pierce Handling with uh, TIFF, uh, Victoria Hale with uh, Institute for One World Health, and through each chapter, that he articulates the story as to how each individual, each creative problem solver, uses their form of integrative thinking uh, through these different types of concepts. What I do in my class kind of stems uh, from this, and I teach my great quality business leadership kids. Uh, I give them their experiences, projects, certain readings uh, from the Harvard Business Review and all over the place, and I give them the tools, the concepts, and the methods of integrative thinking, where they actually apply them all and actually consult to real life organizations. Uh, so in our class, we actually uh, have consulted to places like Northern Carpets Food Bank, Capital to Education, uh, both for profit and non for profit organizations. And last year, we consulted to Metrolinks and the Innovation Hub uh, at University of Toronto, where my kids give tangible recommendations using the integrative thinking theory uh, to these corporations, and they actually implement them into their corporations as well. The real thing that the opposable mind and integrative thinking gives to a, an individual is, is truly amazing because it brings to light our biases, how we look at the world, our goggles that we all have, whether we have glasses or not, we have our own goggles, we have been programmed in a specific way through our experiences, through the, the, the matters in which the experience have impacted us as well, which have created fears, which have created ways in which we have diversity of thought. But not to mention in this diversity of thought, uh, we shun away from certain things as well. And in today's world where we have the most messiest, craziest, complicated issues and problems, the problem solvers usually come up with ways in which only impact a small privileged percentage. And integrative thinking brings to light all of our own internal stuff to give us the courage, to give us the push, and the drive, and the know-how on how to solve these issues. And that is what this book truly gives. The pre or the follow-up to this book from 2007 is now. It was just published a week ago, two weeks ago. Oh, yeah. It's called Creating Greater Choices. And the beauty of this is that uh, Roger Martin and Jennifer Rial actually give the tangible ways, <coughs> tools, and methods on how to use integrative thinking. Uh, the beauty of this is that my kids in my classroom are highlighted here. And my student uh, actually ends the final chapter with this quote. And he states, before I was one of those guys who, when I come up with one idea, one conclusion, I just stick with it. Now I write with pencil. Very insightful. I expand and I erase and I do it over and over and over again and my answers just keep on getting better and better throughout. This is what integrative thinking can do for my kids and I know it has done for many individuals across our corporate 
public education and all over our world. That's pretty good. <laughs> especially during the consolidation. Uh, what are effective examples of math talk and prompts to support the discourse? What kinds of math norms and mindsets do I want to cultivate? How could this look like and sound like in the classroom? So practical kinds of examples. And how might teachers and admin implement? So uh, actually, all these were kind of answered in some fat and some layer form. Um, it's a quite an easy read as well. Uh, I rate this as a, you can read this on the dock, or you can read this at home late night after you put your two, three-year-old to sleep. So it's quite an easy one to do. So the first question, if you're going to go through this, so why math talk? And the book really highlights exactly the fact that if we want students to share their ideas, and students do so first, orally, verbally, before they start with writing and before they do the reading aspect, you want them to talk it out. So the need for them to do it in a structured way is so important for us to not only model how to do it effectively, and but also allow them to explore the ideas and concepts that they have brewing around in their brain as well. <coughs> Through the talk, teachers can guide the students to form the connections from one concept to another. Because math isn't all about, here's a cool thing, here's a cool other fact. It's about making those really strong connections. And that's what this book really helps to do. Help the students with prompts to move from one place to another as well. Uh, oh, yeah, and by the way, there's a back slide. So I also, why math talk as well? Those are the four categories of the achievement chart. And it's really all in there as well. Uh, if we allow them to talk as well, talk about communication, we allow them to also express the other categories as well. And it's right in our curriculum document in terms of the processing skills. How might I structure productive math discourse, especially during the consolidation? So when I talked about this, um, just a couple quick slides. This one here is our TDSB expected practice. So it really does uh, highlight a lot of great practices, best practices and ideas on how a math, comprehensive mathematics program should look like and sound like. And inside, we have a three-part math lesson, but one part in particular is this one. And this is the consolidation phase, in particular known as the highlights and summaries aspect. So this is where this book can help uh, answer some of these questions. How do I productively uh, structure this part of my lesson as well? And the, the authors go in to talk about, well, there's something called the open strategy sharing. But there's also these five targeted ones as well. They'll let you read through them. The idea, though, is that not to, not to bore you to death with really cool and new terminology, the fact is that we actually do a lot of this. As I was reading through this, I actually felt very empowered. I felt that I was given a formal title to what I was doing back in the classroom. And that allowed me to tell my other colleagues, oh, have you done this strategy? And they're like, oh, yeah, let's do that together. And so that's what this book really helps me as well to do. Um, I gave for you as well, when you walked in, there's a handout. So even if you don't vote for my book, oh, even if you don't vote for my book, you get a little handout today. One side in front, it, it tells you the, well, if you will, five plus one kinds of math talk and descriptions. And on the back side, Something, I wanted you to walk away with something you can use in your classrooms tomorrow. So in the book as well, it's about talk moves. Now, it's not originally from this book, 
and the, site, uh, the source is cited at the very bottom. But they use it all the time in this one as well. Uh, so on top of that, just really quickly, this whole book does cultivate all these ideas. It does, talks about the norms and the mindsets that we need to do as well. Bringing that to the forefront to help teachers understand, okay, that's what I need to do first before I even do any kind of talk. So how might teachers and admin implement this? I'm thinking that not only individually, but as a book study, you can do it to determine um, the, where your PLCs are going to go into as well. And so that's why I think that this book should be read by all <coughs> teachers and trust them. <laughs> 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 uh, so that we can stimulate professional learning discussions board-wide and possibly beyond. So I have just five minutes to convince you that the one book that you should choose to read this year is Calm, Alert, and Learn by Dr. Stuart Shanker. And I've chosen to use an Ignite Talk format as a method for persuading you. This may, be, may seem to be the opposite of Calm, because I have no control. The slides are going to go every 20 seconds. <laughs> Bear with me. How well students do in school can be determined by how well they are able to self-regulate. And so what is self-regulation? It's optimal self-regulation. It's a state of calm focus and alertness appropriate to learning. That's the definition that Stuart Shanker uses in his book. So if you are in a hypoactive state, uh, then you need to upregulate. That is, you need to become more alert in order to be in an optimal state for self-regulation and learning. So if you're super bored, super tired, you need more energy. You need to become more alert to be able to learn. Conversely, if you're in a hyperactive state, you need to downregulate. That is, become more calm in order to be in an optimal state for self-regulation and learning. So if you're too excited, if you're, you just came in from recess and something really, really crazy happened, you need to be able to calm down enough to be able to learn. The model for understanding self-regulation that Shanker uses has five domains. Biological, emotional, cognitive, social, and pro-social. All of those contribute to self-regulation. And being aware of all five of these areas will help us. So why this book? First of all, self-regulation isn't just for little kids. It's for adolescent learners. It's for students with special needs. It's for students, it's for students and teachers who want to be mentally healthy, which means it's actually for all of us. All of us in this room could use self-regulation. And reading this book helped me with my own self-regulation. Because if I became dysregulated in class, I had to think, what was causing my stress? What could I do to calm myself down so that my negative reaction did not cause my students to become dysregulated as well? And it helped. Now, I'm not gonna lie, this isn't easy. And it isn't just for school either. This summer, I volunteered to take care of my friend's 11-month-old twins for a day. They cried for most of the day. I, now, I could have chalked this up to my rusty baby mining skills. After all, my youngest is 15. I could have said that, but instead I actually considered what was provoking them. They weren't at home, they were away from their mommy, they didn't have their double stroller or their high chair or their baby bum video that they watched to help them nap. They had my mother, my mother-in-law, and me <laughs> at my house, <laughs> which didn't have any of these things. So they weren't bad babies, and I wasn't a bad babysitter. But I did what I could to help them calm down. And even if it meant becoming a makeshift bed for an hour and a half, it really was an hour and a half. <laughs> so I reframed the behavior so that it was a positive experience in the end. Don't take my word for it, though. I spoke to Aviva Dunsinger. Do people know her? She's the recipient of the Prime Minister's Award for Teaching Excellence and is on Twitter a lot. And she says, self-regulation works for everyone. Contemplating, asking yourself, why this child and why now 
will change how you view children. And it shares scenarios in the book that ring true and use a self-regulation lens to help address issues. So if you're feeling drained because your students look like they can't sit still, if you're feeling overwhelmed because you've got angry middle schoolers, if you have somebody who seems tuned off and tuned out by school, somebody on the autism spectrum disorder, all this helps. The book provides practical suggestions that can be implemented quickly and shares connections to other programs that can support the development of self-regulation. Um, so there are many options that work well with this book. So it's not just by itself. But don't get the wrong impression. Call of Weird and Learning isn't just a list of ideas. The book is based on current educational research, and it's often Canadian research, with Canadian examples. So the book makes the research make sense, which is kind of refreshing. <laughs> it makes you feel smart. Mm -hmm. Now, People for Education have a project called Measuring What Matters. And they say education is valued some skills over others. <coughs> and one of the things that people wants to examine is social emotional skills. Stuart Shanker wrote the foundational report for People for Education. He's a leader in this field, and he's Canadian. Now, you know the TDSB mission is to enable all students to reach high levels of achievement and to acquire the knowledge, skills, and values that they need to become responsible members of a democratic society. It's going to be challenging, folks, if students cannot deal with stress. So therefore, we've heard some great examples. To be able to use integrated thinking, like Raheem promoted in his book, you need to be calm and alert. <laughs> <laughs> Like what Chris shared, you need to be calm and alert. <laughs> you see where this is going, right? <laughs> to be able to center indigenous education in the curriculum, like in the book Christina is going to share, you need to be calm and alert. <laughs> to be able to make social change in education, like in the book Jennifer is going to share, you need to be calm and alert. <laughs> so all of these tasks need learners from all ages and stages to be calm and alert and ready to learn, which is why I recommend this as a must-read book for 2017-2018 school year. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Diana. Uh, we will next. <laughs> Perspectives from First Nations, Inuit, and Native peoples in Canada by Rachel A. Michaud. I should have asked for Michaud. Yeah, Michaud. And Dr. Pamela Rose Tutus. Yes. So, uh, bonjour, everybody. Um, I'm Christina. And um, why should you use this book um, to help decolonize education? Why else should you use this book to basically help? Um, with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to actions. And as educators, we should be responding to number 63, which states, um, have educators to develop and implement K-12 curriculum and learning resources on Aboriginal peoples in Canadian history and the history and legacy of residential schools. Now, I chose this book simply because it has perspectives from First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples and um, non-fiction um, texts, and also fiction texts as well. Um, another reason why I chose this, and I'm pretty sure, if I get this quote right, but I heard John, I'm pretty sure it was John Molloy who had said that if we provide teachers with appropriate support and resources, their engagement will increase so they may transform learning. And if we use evidence-based pedagogy, accelerated by digital tools and resources, then student engagement and student achievement will, occur, and will increase as well. So it's about putting texts like this into the hands of the students who we are here to work with. Um, Rachel Michelin and Pamela Toulouse, Toulouse are the, um, I guess, the curators to this book. And they basically went um, and found um, different authors and um, curated and put different stories into this book. So, um, let's see. Many of the visuals, so many, so sorry, going back to 
the collection of fiction and nonfiction selections, and then many of the visuals in the books are also uh, photos and artworks uh, are by First Nation artists. And um, there's also a short biography of each author and um, artist in here. So um, when you're sharing this with the students, then also get that aspect of the story as well. Um, it's divided into two separate um, um, worldviews, if you look at the table of contents. So the first one is in an indigenous uh, knowledge or um, point of view of using the medicine mill in the four, four, uh, four directions. And then the other um, um, perspective that the, that the uh, curators, I'm using the word curators, but um, they're using it as a uh, alternative table of contents where each of the readings um, that if you want to, to talk about different issues of personal identity, traditional teachings, reaching goals, social justice, political struggle, and history. Um, and then there is also, which is, as, a learn, as an instructional leader, and when I go to schools, I get many questions about who are the First Nation people of Canada, or the First Nation Métis Inuit? What does Aboriginal mean? What does Indigenous mean? And so there's a very good um, explanation as to, the, um, to those peoples in this book. So I feel like this would be a very good um, book that if you didn't, if teachers didn't feel comfortable um, um, teaching the content, that this would help them in their journey. And um, basically also it's very good for, in terms of literacy. So the target audience for this selection is um, grade seven to 12. And it's good learning not only for the teacher, but also for the students. And um, it has reading strategies um, such as analyzing text and illustrations, asking questions, activating prior knowledge. So all of those rich um, reading um, um, things, I won't say thank you. The techniques, thank you, that you need, that, you need, that the kids need to, uh, and to, to assess the curriculum. And um, I think that's it. And I, yeah, so, oh, sorry. Also with this, and there's a teacher guide. <laughs> right? so every book, every teacher wants a teacher guide to support the text. And so um, I really hope that you take a look at this book and use it in your classrooms. We wish. So I'm here to convince you that Maxine's essays are essential reading for all educators. So Maxine was a brilliant mind and she was an enthusiastic and really open teacher. She was an activist and a philosopher. She was an educator for most of her 96 years. I think she just passed away this year. She was immensely curious and she was constantly questioning the world. And she loved the arts. Paintings, music, literature, those are the means she used to interrogate the world for the purpose of making it a better place. So I was introduced to Maxine Green's work about 25 years ago and it, trans it really transformed my thinking about what education should be and it inspired me about what teaching could be. So Maxine Green is actually considered quite a big deal in education. She ranks along with Paulo Freire and John Dewey and as foundational thinkers in education and schooling. You would have to Google her later to find out her long list of national and international awards. So she even has a school in New York City named after her 
called the Maxine Green High School for Imaginative Inquiry. So, in honor of Maxine Green's book, Releasing the Imagination, I'm going to take you on a four-minute imaginative tour of the Maxine Green School for Imaginative Inquiry. And through that tour, I will use her words as a way to invite you to further explore her book. So, we are going to now walk up the walkway into <coughs> the front doors of the Maxine Green School for Imaginative Inquiry. And we see a beautiful mural. And on that mural, it states, within these doors, you will be asked to realize your deep connection to and responsibility for not only our own individual experience, but also for other human beings who share this world. Now we're going to continue down the hallway to the staff room of the Maxine Green School for Imaginative Inquiry, and we hear our colleagues questioning the world and schooling. They are trying to figure out who they want to be as people in the world and as educators in the school system. They are questioning what is normal, what is habitual, and seeing things as they could be otherwise. The staff are interrogating, sometimes with hope and optimism, and sometimes with anger, sorry, not calmness, Diana, for the purpose of making the world and the school a better place. The pedagogy of these teachers is one of alert engagement and activism. Teachers try to tell the truth. They try to stand out against violence and war and exploitation and oppression. They try to act in fairness balance and peace, and they try to enact the power of love that does justice. In this school, we begin our day with a call to social justice, although in this school we use Maxine's preferred term, which is social imagination. Social imagination is our shared responsibility to take care of each other and to use our imagination for good. In this school, we recognize that children are struggling to survive and make sense of a world that we and they know already is neither equitable nor fair. We use our classroom activities to stretch our social imaginations. Each classroom space strives to be humane and liberating community in which every learner is recognized and sustained in his or her struggle to learn how to learn, not what to learn. We notice students immersed in reading, writing, and creating. During the school day, we immerse ourselves in the arts and wonder about what is beautiful. Music, visual arts, poetry, literature, and drama are the focus and are given more teaching time and more resources than math or science. Students are expected to be able to express themselves in a number of different languages, including imagery, music, and dance. Art is not the underdog in the educational system. In the recycling bins, we notice lesson plans that are based on technical skills and standardized curriculum. And in the garbage, we see remnants of bureaucratic, indifferent, and uncaring policies and procedures and standardized assessments. All right, I have to move on. I'm running out of time. So here we end the tour. And who would like to return for yet another more in-depth tour? Who heard a vision of education that resonated with them? If you did, then you need to read Maxine's book, <laughs> Releasing the Imagination. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Well done. Thank you to all the panelists. Um, we certainly made our job of choosing one book a real challenge. I'm sure like, you really want to read them all, but you have to make a choice. So to help a little bit in that process, I would like to open uh, the floor for some discussion. And I think what we're going to do is we're going to run it from <laughs> we're going to start again. That was okay. That's okay. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to invite you to start thinking about a question that you might have for each of the panelists. And you're going to let me know if there's any questions that have come into us. Is there a question from the floor for Ricky? So we have to integrate all of the things that we have to come back to that. So, Ricky Munson, I'm going to start us off. 
Oh, I'm sorry, we have one. I'm just, I, I just said, if you give the ability of the book to a great book, to this teacher, how would you apply the book to a kindergarten? Well, that's, that, that's great that you asked that, actually. This year, thinking is actually been pushed across uh, not only uh, Ontario, but Canada from K to 12. And you can ask one of our great coaches here, and that integrated thing is having a big piece. Not only uh, within a business class, but actually everything from the arts to science, uh, to, to humanities, to French, uh, and they're using it in so many different ways, even mathematics as well. Uh, the tools of integrated thinking range from the ladder of inference, uh, causations, um, even uh, other specific tools where kids can use even something called the pro pro chart. We're all familiar with the pro con chart. Uh, but it was actually coined in my class, the pro pro chart, about five years ago, where instead of looking at negatives to any piece of the pie, you're actually looking at just the positives when coming up with that other alternative. We have kids in grade one using the pro pro chart. We have kids in grade three using uh, the ladder of inference, which states on how certain individuals take a data, and a, a pool of information, and come up to specific conclusions. We have kids using that in science and math. Uh, which is pretty interesting and applicable uh, all across. We're actually using this even across the world as well now, uh, which is very special. Were there examples in the book? From yes, the in this book now. Are, yeah, so these are more of the, the methods and the models, and, and the new book is more about the tangible ways in which it can be used. Currently now, uh, every year at Rothman, we do a... Uh, more like a science fair, but it's like an icon fair, mm -hmm. where kids across the province come in and share what they're learning, <coughs> uh, which is very special as well. So it's pretty cool to have my high school kids with their you know ties and nice dresses, and then they got a little uh, five-year-old kid talking about a cool big sale that they did, and where they use the ladder inference for how they actually did a cool uh, project uh, measuring certain temperatures of water in the stream close to their school, uh, which is very special, actually. Hope that answers your question. Another question for you? No, I think we'll do is we'll go through and we'll give everybody uh, at least one question, and then we'll open it up so that we can... So I'm going to turn to, to Chris. If there's a question for Chris, can you hold your book
That's what they do a lot to help provide their learning skills. Why was that student proud of their work as compared to something you're doing as well? We're talking about building up and supporting our students to be globally competent. It's not just about strand itself. And the first couple chapters really laid that out. The norms are so important. It breaks through all of those specific and overall expectations. Thank you. I feel like you've got a little pro-pro. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, don't you dare me to read it. I'm going to turn. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Next one. Oh, so you want to ask that question? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're going to turn. Please tell me it's not changing diapers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you mentioned, I mean, great topic and uh, really relevant today, self-regulation. Um, I have a strong interest in mindfulness, and um, does the book go into that? Because um, it's not just about learning. It's about managing yourself and being able to have a, uh, a calm presence so that you can know that you have that calm within you um, to be able to manage your relationships and obviously your learning, but so all of it. So does the book go into mindfulness? So the short answer? Yes. <laughs> the longer answer is that they divide up the, the table of contents into those five domains, but then further chapters talk about self-regulation in special education and self-regulation in children's mental health. So there is an entire section that is devoted to mindfulness. They talk about yoga practices, and um, I did like, too, how they talked about teachers because teachers get burned out, teachers that are stressed, and that if we as educators can have those self-regulation um, skills and techniques uh, and, and reframe our own behavior, that we will be healthier, happier, not just educators or in school, in the learning environment, but in the life as well. Um, and also, um, Stuart Schenker is doing a, a Toronto Institute for Self-Regulation -Reg coming up in December. So it's a two-day event um, here, uh, so that there are other ways that you can, you can read the book, but you can also attend uh, his, his conferences or attend the, uh, the Merit Center, which is the organization that he works with. They also have um, regular talks on Twitter. So, thank you. You're welcome. So, question for Christina. So there's a bunch of time during the time was for grade six, seven, twelve. Yeah. Do you think you could use it with younger students? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It can be differentiated. Um, I think obviously for grade seven and eight, it's a book that you can put in their hands and if they have their reading skills at that level, they can read. But as a like as a teacher, as a primary teacher at elementary, I've used it and um, you know going through texts in, in the sense of like guided reading form and and just talking about you know the different issues that come out right in the terms of social justice and basically helping to um, like get that understanding to kids that you know here's a history of people that have been colonized and they may not get those concepts but it's a book that would help start to facilitate that conversation and basically showing you know as in elementary school you want students to be resilient well here's a selection of, of stories that you can read to them um, that show resiliency of, of the people as well and showing positive role modeling and such right so diversity culture, you know, and in a lot of our elementary schools and high schools, you know, it is a different uh, cultural domain, multicultural and, um, equity, you know, so, um, so yeah, that helps with all this. Thank you very much. Um, so, Jennifer, is there a question about what you said? <coughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask 
since then, the elephant in the room, which is one of the things. I have a question. Your book was originally published about 20 years ago, and, and you said you know, that the author really is one of those key thinkers. But um, I mean, what do you think, if you really had been encapsulated, encapsulated in a sentence or two or something short, what really is the core of what makes it essential for the development for space? Uh, for today. I mean, now, even though something is older, it doesn't mean it doesn't have pretty things. <laughs> 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 That's a personal connection I'm making. <laughs> <laughs> and I read a ton of professional books. I do teacher books on techniques on how to make everything you know, more interesting and engaging for students and, and thinking of different ways to, to try things out. So this book is a philosophical book. This book is for the big ideas. It pulls back from all of that and says, you know, why are we doing this? For what purpose? And what could it look like? And, and focuses on that, on that idea of imagination, which is not used so much in educational discourse anymore. So I would say reading the book is important because it just it provokes a lot of questions and critical awareness on the part of the teacher as you read it. And Maxine will use music and she'll use artwork and she'll use literature and say, come with me for a moment. I'm going to really mess you up a bit. Like, that's what she does. She's a problem. You know, she's a philosopher. She just says, think about this, think about this. So it's not an easy read. I'm not going to say this is like one that you can read into in the morning. It's, it's going to call out to you to think, to think through it. And it's challenging. But I think it's important. Thank you. Each of our panelists has responded to a single question. But I'd now like to just open it up so that at random, if there's something that's occurring to you, you'd like to ask any of them. Jennifer, after having read the book, imagine any radical change for us. <laughs> well, I think there. I think I sort of did a little plug there earlier about the radical change in assessment practices is a big deal for me, and I like to advocate for that. And teachers have more voice than they think, so they think, "Well, there's this bureaucracy, and I can't do anything." But that's not true. Uh, we can change, and we will change, and we are changing. So I that's, that's one of the big pushes. But also, I do not like the way that curriculum is fragmented into different disciplines. I don't. And so to think through, you know, what are these big ideas and ways of thinking that integrate thinking and really empower students? That's kind of what I, I guess I would change this idea. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to take a total shot at math and science. But if we look at funding and the discourse in education, we hear these, this is important, this is important, this is important. Meanwhile, this is not so important. And I really, I think we need to trouble that up a bit. Just more on that topic, um, like in the grades, there's such a strict timeline for teaching the curriculum. And teachers don't feel like they can be creative and be open-ended and just inquiry. They're like, wow, I have to get this and I have to, I have to cover that strong. So you're absolutely right. Like how do how do teachers and I hear we're moving more toward inquiry, um, more play based, et cetera, moving through the grades from what I hear. And how are they gonna change all the curriculum to enable teachers to be able to yeah, I know that's a totally different presentation, but I like the rates that we I wonder if that's an integrated thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it totally is. <laughs> um, you know, I've been very blessed to, to actually help create with integrated thinking my business initiative that's like, we don't use the regular textbooks that every uh, the POH forum class uses. I just brought this in basically a year ago, but other than that, it's about the experiences, particular readings. Uh, we do code prepping tests. I actually get in a fight with the kid when they walk in on purpose. There's, a, there's an actual uh, script for it. Um, and and it's, it's about understanding how and when we interact with our world, how do we actually unsee certain things as well. And, and that is the consistent, uh, I would say, battle that we as individuals, and, and that we as our youth, and that we as any human being in this world has to contend with. And, and to me, it's not more about inquiry-based learning, it's about inquiry-based living. And I, I think that's what it really is about. Uh, and how do we, uh, on any given day, we have about 20,000 things that are blasted to us, and we don't even know that it's blasted to us. And it's given to us in a particular way, for a particular reason, that makes us act a particular way. But if we don't create that introspection and realize that 
we are being used in a particular fashion uh, and employ techniques of inquiry-based learning or of just consistently questioning and consistently trying to figure out digging and digging and digging and digging deeper as to what the true problem is at hand. Uh, I think that's what we're trying to do. Well, that's what I'm trying to do with coming to the uh, Sometimes when they come to me, it's, I spend uh, so much time undoing certain things and that's why uh, I have such vigor in, in what I'm trying to give to them. And there's such a massive shift within four and a half to five months. I have kids busy with me that I graduated four or five years ago that still say that my class is the only class that actually got them ready for the real world. And I, I think that is is my real wealth. Yeah. Like that's my wealth. That we got people to don't get the wealth, but our paychecks <laughs> 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 I'm driving a whole four hundred civic, so I don't know. But I think the whole piece of the inquiry-based living is what I'm trying to do to the kids, and that constant courage that there is an answer out there, but it's not going to come to you, because what's come to us over the last decades and years is what we use for the last decades and generations, which has gotten to us where we are today. And obviously where we are today is not where we want to be 50 years from now, or 20 years from now, or for my two lovely little kids that I have that are two and a half years and two and a half months. Like, I, I, don't want, I don't want that world that I see now to be what they have to do with 20, 30, 40 years from now. So when it comes to the idea of competencies, integrative thinking hits them all on so many different levels. And it's up to us as an individual to figure out how deep we want to hit them. I hope that helps with the conversation. Mm -hmm. You use that word competencies, and I don't know if any of the panelists might like to uh, make a comment in TSB. We, we're talking about the vision for learning, and we're talking about global competencies, and all of you have addressed that in your uh, talk today. Would any of you like to make a comment about how you see your work connecting to global competencies? There's only there's all these connections. I'm saying there's like yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think where to start with all these. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. I mean, collaboration. I was gonna say yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. 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 Creativity. Yeah. 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 So yeah, it's like it's, it's definitely there. Um, I guess with the with the big strong connection for the for for this book, I suppose. Is, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the big strong connection of this book, for example, is I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about my kid as well, just like yours, and how he, as he started to talk things through, he's three years old, so as he started to talk things through, the world around the possibilities are starting to come together. So be, as, as a mentor once told me, the person that's doing the talking is usually doing the person that's doing the learning. So when we were in university, we paid professors to learn more, right? <laughs> the idea behind this is not about the teacher doing the talk. It's about making, giving the power to the students with prompts, with techniques, with the norms, so that they feel comfortable, so that they can communicate in an effective, meaningful way so that they can start to make connections. And I feel that in our global companies, 21st century learning, what, what the jobs that we haven't even thought about that our students, our kids, our, our young ones are gonna grow up into, what we do know for sure is that those values, those learning skills, and those competencies regardless of what career path, regardless of what you're going to get into, will stay with you and make you successful no matter what. That's my personal big thing about it as well. Beyond that as well, I'm a big proponent, not only, I don't know if it's completely connected to the global conflict, but I, I, I subscribe to, uh, to the idea, Maslow before Bloom. So we, we heard of that in the before, so we have the hierarchy of, the hierarchy of things of, uh, of Bloom's taxonomy, but you also have Maslow's. Uh, yeah, you know, well know this. Yeah, interactive. Yeah. <laughs> and so, what I found when I was reading this book, in my other notes, like it starts to make the triangle of as the person, as the community of learners are starting to communicate with one another, 
up goes their sense of belonging, up goes your sense of self-perception as well. And research has shown, I can't tell you exactly which, which body of research, but as it was told to me by our student achievement officer, that a person's self-perception is a greater indicator of their success more so than their marks and achievements. So if you increase the ability for students to have a good self-perception, which, as we know, our perceptual data in our EQAO, like those personal surveys are showing, we have a very large decrease in our female population, 20 plus percent lower than our males, for example, and yet they still do as well, if not better, in mathematics. But that gap will increase if we don't intervene and help them, guide them to their self-realization that they are worth it, that they are mathematically minded for another, for another term. Well, that's to be said with the, you know, the indigenous population as well, especially within our, within our schools. I mean, like, with, you know, they're, they're coming with so many social inequities. And uh, when you're using, like, texts that are about specific peoples, um, you know, it's going to bring out that self-identity and make these students want to learn about the culture for one, especially in urban education um, in the city, and also, you know, for them to be successful and, and then to go on to high school and, you know, and be mindful and, you know, um, um, so, yeah, I think, you know, when we're following these, like, competencies or, you know, um, these are all things to, that we need to think about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Or from anybody tweeted in um, I'm going to ask this question for any of you. Um, after reading uh, your book, what would a teacher's classroom look like? What would be a key? What might be a change? What would you expect to see? Um, if in reading the book, there's some um, tangible, visible representation <coughs> of learning on behalf of the, the reader that's impacted the professional practice. Anyone want to take that? Okay. Well, I believe that, you know, after reading this book, I mean, students, because I, I feel firmly believe that those perspectives of Indigenous people are not represented well within, our, within the school board or any, any education. I mean, it's starting to, and that's what my job is, you know, to, to do, is to help, you know, teachers to do that. And I feel by, you know, including this book, you know, you know the students are getting that shared history or that history of, you know, um, knowing that, you know, there were a, a group of people that were here before, you know, um, kind of more, more, more of, per se, you know, uh, colonization, and and whether or not, like, it's hard for teachers to want to teach those hard subjects of residential schools or 60s school, but at the end of the day, it's starting with, you know, these small concepts, but I would say small, to negate away from the issue, but, um, you know, just, just talking about, you know, perhaps in the north and, and seeing a different perspective of how and how people live. And so I feel like the students will become, again, going back to um, um, self-advocacy, you know, not only for themselves, but for a group of people that, that need that. So that's just going to point. Great, thank you. So it's funny that you asked about, you know, what would you see if you were to dive into the book and make changes because there's actually sections in there called application in the classroom and one of those scenarios that we talked about was about a grade one teacher um, who had been teaching for 10 years but she had found that she was getting drained that it seems like the, the student she says as a hearing the students seem to be changing they're not as blank as they used to be and one of the things they talked about was looking at the physical setup here for your classroom because some students um, are overwhelmed by visual and auditory stimuli. So the book talked about, for instance, the Reggio Emilia. Did I say that right? Yeah. yeah. The Reggio Emilia approach where less is more. So, uh, you know, taking down some of all the, 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 the visual noise and clutter and just making it <coughs> tiny here. 
and I tried that for myself, even in the library, is I took down some of the posters that I had up forever because I didn't think kids were looking at it anymore. And the kids and I know the pain. It looks, there's something different. They couldn't, yeah. <laughs> no, they didn't say that. They said it was, like, is it bigger in there? <laughs> But there was something, and, and it was a little bit more kind of calming, yes. Because, you know, the, the more muted colors and, and things like that. So, that's, um, so there's a lot of things that you'd be able to see and to hear. And the nice thing, too, about the self-regulation is the self part. That you, your goal is that the students and the teachers are the ones that use the tools. So it's not, oh, don't forget to do your figure eight breathing, your circle eight breathing. It's the student who says that the circle eight breathing is a cool thing there and photograph your page. And you take your finger, and there's, once again, it talks about the physical relation between your physical and your mental. And so you take your finger, and you trace the, the figure eight. And as you do it, you breathe in and out. And out. So, being able for them, for you know, for people to be able to take it upon themselves to find the right tool in your toolbox to help you become calm if you're in a hyper <coughs> or alert if you're not.
exquisite graphic design that there's a uh, rounding up of everybody, every little detail, the room set up, scrubbing the table, every inch, and so much things uh, happen. Uh, and working with the custodial setup and everything, uh, just congratulations. Yeah. Uh, also, our other two librarians here, when they're not doing tech support, are <laughs> on them to take your phone calls, your texts, your tweets. They will do research for you, find you books on your topic, help you navigate the literature, the infosphere, uh, Judy Emmeline and Jean Chang. <laughs> and uh, just a few great ways to keep the conversation going with you. Uh, one way I would really recommend is uh, if you sign up with our blog, if you go in and register on our blog once or twice a week, you get a really, really great email. But if you have a higher volume tolerance, you can follow us on Twitter, <laughs> Pinterest for our new books. But the blog is a really nice way to get a hippie statement. But uh, uh, in terms of uh, any other research needs, you know that we're here to serve you. This is my chance for uh, the commercial plug. And also, just outside, uh, the librarians have pulled together books on the themes that our presenters have discussed this evening, as well as each of the books that they've pitched is available for loan, but they've upped the demand so much you'll have to sign up on, on a wait list for that. But we feel we have been inviting to do that. And, uh, we have been going and looking for multiple copies, and I don't know, uh, Jennifer, if anybody told you, well, we've got them online, and so they're older copies, and they have all highlighted marginalia. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I get the, is this one probably free by the terms? Yeah. <laughs> you won't be able to renew it because no, it's yeah. off. Like, uh, and uh, just so uh, the party won't be over, we'll have a chance to talk a little bit more in depth about whatever the winning book is. Um, we're going to uh, be co-hosting a special TDSB Twitter chat on Thursday, January 25th. <laughs> And just one more plug uh, for the uh, uh, TDSB uh, and Twitter chat. Tomorrow night, uh, Christina is going to be moderating uh, a Twitter chat on Indigenous education. And so to join in either of those, it's hashtag TDSB Ed on Twitter. Uh, so now we're coming uh, uh, to the conclusion of our first or inaugural teacher's meeting discussion. Uh, and uh, you, you've already heard you're going to be able to view the recording of tonight's events, uh, share it with your friends. Uh, there's a, a, a bit.ly TSB teachers read, you have it in other documents. There it is. Uh, and uh, also, we just have a few tokens of our deep appreciation uh, for uh, Raheem, Chris, Diana, Christina, and Jennifer. <laughs> Online, uh, please uh, vote and have a great. Thank you.